at the beginning of this mission, we heard how the sacred scriptures, tradition, and the fathers of the church teach in unison that at some point near the end of time, the Antichrist will rise to power. He will be a real man. He will not be the incarnation of the devil, but he will be as close to such a thing as the devil can accomplish simply because this man of sin will be the combination of all the evil men the world has ever experienced in her entire history. All the big and little antichrists built into one. Wrap your mind around that. Think about it. This man of sin will be the combination of all the evil men the world has ever seen. So we can determine from that alone that this particular evil man is not present among us, at least in power at this moment. Nobody is that smart or that evil at this time. In a word then, he will be the most powerful man of sin the devil can produce and the world has ever seen. Now it is clear and it's commonly agreed upon by the saints and doctors of the church that he will only rise to supreme power by completely outlawing the Holy Mass. Now there are a couple of reasons for this. Let's name them. Number one, the Antichrist will insist on being worshipped as God. And on that account, will not allow anyone but himself to be worshipped. Think of the third temptation of Christ. He was trying to get Christ to bow down and worship Him. That's what He wants the whole world to do. Since God is worshipped most perfectly through the Holy Mass... It must be outlawed. Very interesting. Just as the king will not allow any other lover, so also the Antichrist will permit no one else to be worshipped but himself. You see that? No other lover for the king, for the Antichrist, no one will be allowed to worship anyone but me. Second reason. And more to the point of this mission, the Mass prevents him from rising to power. The Holy Mass is what prevents him from rising to power. It's one of the things. As we know from the Scriptures, this man of sin eventually enthrones himself in the temple of God. And somehow, Rome will become the seat of the Antichrist, we are told. This is the abomination of desolation the high watermark of the devil's revolution. Now, there are a few signs that things are moving in this direction even now, such as various long-standing Catholic churches, centuries old, have either become museums, mosques, or used for some other profane purposes like apartments, restaurants, dance halls, government buildings, or torn down altogether. Another sign, the state rising up to replace the church, taking the place of worship in a country, suppressing and exiling the religious orders and congregations, and replacing the holy days with holidays. These are all signs of the working of the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist in the world. Now, given these sobering truths, we can ask, okay, how long can the world continue without the Holy Mass? I think we have enough information to answer that. About three and a half years. That's the answer. How long can the world continue without the Holy Mass? About three and a half years. Because that is how long the King of kings and the Lord of lords will allow, will permit the Antichrist to reign when he rises to world dominance and power. And this three and a half years will be the darkest time the world will ever know. The prophet Daniel says, 
from the time when the continual sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination unto desolation shall be set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And that's repeated in other places. St. Augustine and many others hold that during this time, the saints will flee to the mountains. They will flee to the deserts. They will crawl into caves and still offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass secretly, being given divine protection to do so. As St. Padre Pio famously said, it would be easier for the world to exist without the Son than without the Holy Mass. So, somehow, even secretly, the Mass needs to be said for the world to continue. I think we we have a hard time with that. At the center of this universe is a cross, is Calvary. And this universe will not exist without that being there. How is that represented? The Mass. St. John of the Cross. The universe is a cosmic palace for the bride, the church. This cosmic palace needs the love of the bride and the bridegroom. And where is that love made? Calvary. How will this three and a half years end? Well, we have this approved prophecy by Blessed Dionysius of Lutzenberg. And this has some scriptural basis in 2 Maccabees chapter 2. Here's from Blessed Dionysius. After the discovery of the Ark of the Covenant, Enoch and Elias will restore the holy sacrament of the altar. Because of the fact that the Ark of the Covenant will be in the possession of the two holy prophets and not in the possession of the Antichrist, the Jews will recognize that Jesus Christ is the true Messiah. A great throng of Jews from all lands will then make their way to Mount Nebo. Now, Mount Nebo is in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant is lost. And it speaks of what's going to happen when it's found. And here it is. The Jews will come to believe in the Holy Eucharist, the true manna. Symbolized by the manna in the jar, in the ark. They will come to believe in Our Lady, the living ark of the covenant. Like Moses of old on Mount Nebo, seeing the promised land before him, the Jews will attend the Holy Mass and see the doorway to the promised land of heaven open before their eyes. They will convert as a people. They will see the Lord as the Lamb of God and the Blessed Virgin as the highest honor of our race. Scripture says that the preaching and work of Enoch and Elias will last 1,260 days after which they will be martyred and resurrected three days later. Although the finding of the Ark and the reinstitution of the Holy Mass come late in their efforts, it shows that the Antichrist cannot last long once the Mass is back in place. Okay, quiz. How long does the Antichrist last after the death of Enoch and Elias? 30 days. That's all he can live with the Mass in place. These amazing events highlight the power of the Holy Mass. Only by its near complete suppression can the greatest of all the devil's efforts seem to succeed. Efforts that are based upon millennia of experience. Efforts that are allowed by the broadest permissions of God. The broadest ever given. And yet, through the Holy Mass, this evil fiend, this general of the revolution, will utterly fail. Do we love the Holy Mass? Do we know where we are? I think if we did, we would die. The King is there. He reigns through the Mass. He conquers through the Mass. He protects us through the Mass. 
Now we know the Holy Catholic Church, the kingdom of God on earth, the bride of the king, is Roman. It is centered in Rome on the Vatican Hill where we find St. Peter's Basilica, one of the world's finest edifices. At the heart of this magnificent structure is the altar built upon the bones of St. Peter himself. If you've ever taken the Scavi tour, which is the tour of the necropolis under the basilica, you will know that there are four altars, four, built upon the bones of the first pope. It is important to note how this, how the successors of Peter did not tear down the existing altars, but rather built newer ones upon the older ones. Isn't that interesting? They never tore down the old altar. They built upon it. That's something for modern liturgists to consider. They never tore down the old altars, but built upon them. These altars are, as it were, built on rock, and they were immovable. It would have been a sin to tear it down. Did not the king say as much, I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Even if St. Peter's were somehow destroyed someday, God forbid, the symbolism is clear. Here, in the Holy Mass, is the main source of our ability to remain secure, immobile, in the face of hell's perfect storm. To remain immovable rocks in the flooding river of revolution that flows forth from the devil's foul and fetid mouth. In the center of St. Peter's Square, we go outside the Basilica now. You know the picture. You've seen it. Within the arms of St. Peter's Basilica itself is uncaptured Egyptian obelisk. Now this is not a very Catholic symbol, if you know your symbology. In fact, it is a preferred symbol of Freemasons and other occultists. For example, if you go to any graveyard, we find that the Masons like to put obelisks over their graves, and we put crosses on ours. Now, to complete the scene, however, we must remember that this obelisk is surrounded by the saints on the colonnade. They're all looking at it. Furthermore, this obelisk has a cross on top of it. And it was exercised before being erected on the Feast of the Triumph of the Holy Cross in 1586. And finally, at the bottom of this obelisk, you will find these words put there by Pope Sixtus V. Christus vincit, regnat, imperat, ab omni malo, plebem suam defendat. Christ conquers, he reigns, he commands. May he defend his people from all evil. These magnificent and profound words are in the present tense to indicate that Christ's triumph is always actual over the power of the occult and all the disorder in man that the obelisk stands for. So what does this mean? It means this. The Vatican Hill is our Sinai. The Vatican Hill is our Sinai. And the obelisk is the golden calf. It is the best the devil can accomplish. And it is in the grip of St. Peter's. It's saying, no revolution, no matter how powerful, no matter how alluring, can triumph against the church. For those who have faith, we know this is accomplished primarily through the perpetual sacrifice of the altar, the Holy Mass. No wonder then, nearly every revolution that has passed through the world in the last five centuries especially has constantly attacked and sought to suppress, to overturn, to replace the Holy Mass in some way or other. Let us then ponder now. Let us meditate, as it were, 
upon the saying of Pope Sixtus V, starting at the end, ob omni malo plebem suam defendat. May he defend his people from all evil. That is what I want for you at the end of this mission, that each of us here will be protected from all evil, such that we will be together again on that day, that triumphant day, that day of judgment at the end of time, standing victorious with our King, standing as it were on the colonnade of St. Peter's Basilica, looking down at the best of the devil's efforts symbolized by that captured Egyptian obelisk. And Mass, I assure you, is the greatest preparation that we have for that day. Because in the Mass, it is the very same Christ that we shall meet and we shall serve and we shall adore for all eternity. In a sense, Mass is preparation for eternity. In a sense, eternity is the Mass. One long worship and love of God. Those who faithfully embrace the King now in this most blessed of sacraments will not fear His full manifestation whenever and however they are called to meet Him. And so we pray at the Holy Mass, at the Libra Nos, deliver us, we beseech Thee, O Lord, from all evil, past, present, and to come. That through the assistance of Thy mercy, we shall be always free from sin and secure from all disturbance. Now, as we've seen, the Mass keeps the Antichrist, the greatest man of sin, keeps him at bay. Now, if we pray the Mass devoutly and we seek Him there, the Christ, with a sincere heart, we can ward off the greatest of evils with the blood of the King, the Lamb of God, purpling the lips of the faithful through Holy Communion. The lentils of the King's interior castle, they become a terror to the Satan. And the exterminating angel must pass on. Furthermore, the Eucharist is like the divine lightning rod that wards off the thunderbolts of divine justice. As a tender and devoted mother presses her child to her bosom, puts her arms around it to shield it with her very body to save it from the wrath of an angry father. So Jesus multiplies His presence on our altars everywhere. He covers the world and envelops it with His merciful presence And as a result of that, the divine justice does not know where to strike. It dares not. Think about it. The more churches that close down, the more this changes, the more openings the world has for the wrath of God. The more the altars are abused, the more openings there are. Oh, how unhappy are those nations and individuals who have fallen away from the Holy Eucharist. Oh, how unhappy are those nations, those cities, those towns and places who have fallen away from the Holy Eucharist. What darkness invades their castles. What confusion and coldness and divisions invade their minds and their hearts. Satan alone rules supreme. And with him, all the evil passions are let loose. Now to defend his people, therefore, to make their castles impregnable to the wily enemy of our king and all of mankind, his royal majesty must gain the victory. He must reign supreme. He must give orders. Thus we say, Christus vincit, Christus regnat, Christus imperat. Christus vinci, Christ conquers through the Holy Mass and all the holy sacraments that flow from it. His majesty has fought and he has won control of the field of battle down through time. The Eucharistic king, he conquered the Jewish temple by fulfilling all the rites on Calvary. Thus the temple curtain split 
from the top to the bottom. Something that man could not do. What was meant to be a complete defeat for the king turned into an eternal victory. The temple was later destroyed, but the mass continues unto the consummation of the world. In hoc signo vinces, Christus vincit. The king then conquers the nations. Roman paganism was overcome by the offering of the mass in the catacombs and in the various houses of the Roman Empire. With the blood of the martyrs mingled with Christ's royal blood on the altar of sacrifice, Rome became the eternal city. Each pagan temple in Rome was conquered by converting it into a chapel, a church, a monastery, where the Holy Mass was offered daily with the king reigning in his tabernacle and his flag raised in the tabernacle light, the vigil light. Again, it is a sign of our times. If you've been to Rome, you know what I'm talking about. It's a sign of our times that the revolution has stolen many of these very sites, turning them into museums or other profane buildings. Now, when Hernan Cortez overthrew the Aztecs, he whitewashed the places used for human sacrifice and had masses offered there. Soon, the Ark of the Covenant, Our Lady of Guadalupe, came and millions converted. This is a type of the end time when the conversion of the Jews for those who have eyes to see. As we heard, the ark will be found, the mass will be reestablished, the Jews will convert. This is symbolized in Our Lady of Guadalupe. But it also symbolizes a type of how the Russians will convert. That's why we've not yet seen it. It will be bigger than Guadalupe. An altar for the king was erected in the grotto of Lourdes, a previous location for pagan and occult activity. Masses were offered daily and millions were healed and still are being healed, both spiritually and physically, well over half of them due to a benediction from the most holy sacrament of the altar. All of these are signs that in due time our noble king will subject the entire universe to his gentle rule. Christus vincit. In order for his majesty to conquer in us and the world around us, therefore, we need to come into contact with this eternal sacrifice. We must subject ourselves to him, reigning in the mass and on our altars. We must swear fealty to him making attendance at the Holy Mass of the greatest importance, campaigning with His Majesty. What? It's best done how? On our Catholic knees. It is best accomplished by devout attendance at the Holy Mass. How did Joan of Arc win? All you soldiers are going to stop blaspheming. You're going to, sit, you're going to go to confession and you're going to Mass every day. And they did. And they won. In this way, we will shoot down the superstition that victory is essentially the result of big numbers and full bank accounts. The Desert Fathers put it like this, when the Eucharist is received by a person, it burns out, as it were, by a kind of fire. The spirit that occupies his members and it is trying to hide in them and it flees. But the enemy will revile the one whom he is besieging all the more when he sees him cut off from the heavenly medicine. And the more he thinks he is removed from the spiritual remedy, the more fearlessly and frequently will he try make trial of him. What is said here of the fathers and from the fathers of the individual holds for entire cities. It holds for communities, parishes, Whole nations, when they're cut off, the devil will win. When they're cut off from the Mass, Christus vincit, we need the Mass for Christ to be victorious. So next, Christus vincit, Christus regnat. Christ reigns. 
Through Christ, reigning in the Holy Mass, the church is blessed and she's made lovable. We sense the royal presence in our tabernacles. We see His flag, His banner in the vigil lamp. As we discovered a few nights ago, His Majesty, He reigns in the inner room of our castle, the seventh mansion of our souls. And He awaits us to come to Him and to swear fealty to Him, to know Him, to love Him, to adore Him, and to serve Him. And He cannot admit any other lover. No other lover allowed. Now, when we insist on another lover, the cross comes off that obelisk. We leave the embracing arms of St. Peter's and we become another Atlas, another Dorian Gray, straining to hold up our world without God. We choose Barabbas in place of Christ, a murderer. No, this must not be the case for us. He must reign. He must reign in our castles. He must reign in our families, in our cities, our countries. Sunday Mass and Sunday rest must be observed. And charity, order, and peace will return to our country. Christus regnat. Christus imperat. Christ commands. No other king has command over the whole universe. All the nations are his inheritance. As he said, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and teach ye all nations and all things whatsoever I have commanded you. His kingship is absolute. It's exclusive. It's unlimited over the entire human race. Believers and unbelievers alike over the angelic choirs in heaven, as well as those in hell. The devil cannot do the least thing without his permission. Do not be misled. All that is happening, even right now, all those terrible things, and all that has happened in the past, and all that will happen in the future, no matter what it is, has the king's permission. The devil is only God's jailer and sometimes his policemen. Once again, there is no dualism. There's no yin and yang. There's no Manichaeanism in God's universe. Christ's kingly authority extends over the entire universe without exception for all time. All those who fight the good fight, therefore, receive their orders from this king, and he's ever present on our altars. It is at the Holy Mass that we can have the permissions of the devil to do all these evil things repealed and revoked. Go to God your Father pictured here and say to him, is not this sacrifice enough to pay the price? for the sins and the evil that have given the devil the permissions to do these things. Beg him that the permissions be removed and be canceled. This is what we can do in the Mass. The devil received permission to attack St. Peter for his laziness in prayer during the agony in the garden. And soon, the first pope denied his king three times. But the permissions of the evil one, the fiend, began to fade with a look from the holy face. In fact, all the permissions of the devil seemed to give way and fade on Calvary when His Majesty died. Saints sprang out of the earth Pagans were instantly converted. The weak, fearful, and unbelieving disciples were made into apostles in a very short time, able to go out into the whole world and conquer it for their king. Calvary reestablished in the Holy Mass. It's represented here in our churches. Makes such wonders possible even now at every time and place it's offered. The same power is available to you the only way to world order is through this holy mass. 
So in the Holy Mass and from His tent of meeting, the tabernacle on our altars, He renews His commands given to us from His headquarters in the upper room. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And this is why it's called the sacrament of charity. This law is revealed in Holy Communion. When two of His disciples, disbelieving, ran away from Him and were doubting on their way to Emmaus, He offered the Mass for them in their presence. And what happened? They woke up and they ran. They ran back to the upper room and were reunited with the apostles. Was it not the breaking of the bread that made the first Christians so brave in the face of persecution? His majesty's royal law is one. It's holy. It's universal. It's eternal. It will never change or be impaired in any way. He engraves it and promulgates it on our hearts through His very presence. It is the law of love. This is our weapon. How many kings or leaders rule by such love? This love is not imposed by force. And this is why His faithful followers and true lovers would rather die than be disloyal to Him. Death before sin. His rights take precedence. They seek to bring Him glory and honor. So do we consult? Do we seek out our King? Do we long for Him and find Him in the Eucharist, making our decisions in His presence with His help? by attending Mass, spending time in adoration, and studying His commands? Do we take orders from Him? Do we seek to keep our consciences informed of the royal decrees that have issued from time immemorial through His church? This is Christ commanding. Christus Imperat. Let us then serve His Majesty well at Mass by dressing properly and modestly no matter what the weather conditions, by fasting to prepare our bodies, by confessing our sins to prepare our souls, never going to Holy Communion if we're aware of any mortal sin. He comes first. God's rights before mine. Arriving early to pray and staying after to make a proper thanksgiving by receiving Him reverently and devoutly, not chewing Him like normal food, but letting Him rest on your tongue and swallowing when you're ready. Piously and reverently honoring Him as He lay on your tongue, begging for a purification of that organ of your body. By attending to our Holy King outside of Mass, we can also give Him honor and what is His due. Visiting Him when we can and spiritually uniting ourselves to Him frequently throughout the day. If we can't make it into the church, think about Him there. Acting thus, we open the way for His majesty to command, to reign, to conquer us poor sinners and through us the world around us so that we will be among those He defends and delivers from evil in time and eternity. We may be a Magdalene, but if we love Him, He will defend us as He defended her. As our King, He wants to defend us. He has promised to do so. He will triumph completely. He is reigning even now. He conquers all evil. But we must subject ourselves to Him. If you love Me, keep My commandments. He conquers that obelisk lodged in our own hearts when we expose ourselves to His altar. We come within range of St. Peter's. We're inside the colonnade. The saints are there. When we open ourselves up to His passion, death, and resurrection made present again in the Holy Mass, He will reign in our lives and in our homes when we enthrone Him there. We have a choice then. We will end this mission as we began it. We have a choice. We can try to use the various ways of the world and become another Atlas or another Dorian Gray. Or, we can submit to His Majesty our King, Jesus Christ, and find peace and reign with Him forever in heaven. 
Viva Cristo Rey. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.